everyone. Daja Wang Sang Hao. Um, very warm welcome to KW Malaysia's virtual training. Um, we have a guest all the way from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm not sure. Is that where you are calling from, Nick? Are you from Baltimore right now? Are you in Baltimore right now? I am awesome. about 30 minutes north of Baltimore. Okay. Are you a Ravens fan? I am. I am. I thought we were going to go all the way this year. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, without further ado, we have the Nick Wagner all the way from Baltimore to come and share his time and his experience in his business. And I'm going to leave you, Nick, to kind of introduce yourself to all of us. We have about over 150 people, 160 people in this call today. And it's 9 p.m. right now in Malaysia. Everyone is hungry to learn uh, before they go to bed tonight. So um, it's all yours right now, Nick. All right. Awesome. Guys, thank you very much for, for spending your evening with me. I know it's late there. It's the opposite here. It's 9 a.m. here. So we've got quite the time difference. But the information and, and the things that I'm going to be teaching today transcend the country that you're in or the time zone you're in or anything like that. So just to give you some background on me, I've been in the real estate business for 18 years. Um, during those 18 years, I started as a single agent selling homes and I was pushing myself to sell 30 homes a year and then 35 homes a year. The next year I might sell 38 and the year after that it would be like 36. The year after that it would be 39. The year after that it would be 40. And I, I got this like ceiling that I just kept hitting right around the 40 mark. And I realized that if I wanted to go to the next level, I had to change my mindset. I had to change my perspective of what I was going for. So I did that. And for 12 years, I hit that ceiling of about 40. And then in, the, in about four years time, I went from selling 40 homes a year to over 400. And, you know, just to give you an example right now for 2020, in the midst of all this that's going on, and we've got the shutdowns and we've got everybody's working from home. Like we're doing everything that the entire world is doing. And we put 45 homes under contract in the month of May. And then we followed up and we put 47 homes under contract in the month of June. So what I'm teaching, it ended up being perfect for the situation we're in because in reality, it's perfect for any situation. It's not that I'm super smart or I saw this pandemic coming or I planned ahead. No, I was just very real and genuine with the way I approached my business. And that real and genuine is what people gravitate to, especially in times of change and times of disturbance. So what I'm gonna teach you guys is it's more about being a genuine you. Now, I speak to, to agents all over the country, all over the world. I've spent some time in Portugal and, a, and I teach my two-year-old the ABCs. So there's the, there's the lowest level of teaching that I do. Um, but what I, what I like to do is I like to approach things with a very easy to understand. Nothing I'm gonna say today is gonna be overly complicated. Nothing I say today isn't something you can put into effect immediately. Everything I teach you is tactical that you can get into your real estate business immediately and you can start seeing a difference in your business immediately. Okay, so no high theory here. This is the simple basics of what you need to do to build a foundation of your business. Now, here's what I'll tell you. Because it's simple to do, it's also simple not to do. Jim Rohn, one of my, one of my mentors told me that. If it's simple to do, it's also simple not to do. So as you're taking your notes and you're writing things down here, you've got to be starring things. You've got to be making little, little suggestions of how you're going to actually take action. If we spend an hour together and at the end of the hour you go, oh, Nick's a nice guy. And then you never implement anything I taught you. It was a complete waste of your hour. So please understand that everything that I'm going to be talking about I want you to implement, and I want you to implement as fast as possible, as quickly as you can get into it. So let's talk a little bit about uh, lead generation. So I put my notes over here so I have them, but you know, lead generation is what? Lead generation is for all agents. It's for new agents. It's for agents that have been in the business for five, 10, 20, 30 years. Everybody needs to do lead generation. In fact, if you break it down, 
Lead generation is important for any sales career, for any business. If you're a restaurant, you need customers. If you're selling paper towels, you need customers. If you, whatever you're, if you're selling widgets, it doesn't matter. You need customers. And the way to get customers is lead generation. So we talk about lead generation in terms of what it is. It's, it's you finding people that you can help. Okay. That's what we're looking to do. And when it comes to lead generation, we really have three levers that we can pull. And those three levers are who we follow up with, what intensity, and what frequency. So what I mean by that is when I meet somebody, um, and, and in my business, when I was selling 30 to 35, 40 homes a year, and I kept thinking to myself, Every single time I was done one transaction, I was on the hunt for the next one. I was always hunting, 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 hunting. And it got to be a little wearing. It kind of felt like I was on a, one of those hamster wheels, just running in circles. But every year I'd have a good year, but I wasn't any further ahead. So then I changed my perspective and I thought, you know, this year I got five referrals of my 40 deals that I did. Five of them came from other people that already knew me, liked me, trust me, and worked with me, and they sent me somebody that they knew, those were my easiest deals by far. So let's say I want to set a goal next year and I want to sell 50 homes. Well, if I had, I don't know, 10 people that each gave me five referrals, then I'd only focus my energy on those 10 people and get those five referrals and I'd hit my 50 and my life would be a lot easier. Now in reality, finding somebody who's gonna give you five deals a year is a lot. So let's change that. Maybe we need to find you know, 13 people and each of them give me about two and then I hit my 50 that way. Or I'm sorry, uh, uh, 15, 16 people. Or do I find 25 people and I want two? Or do I find 50 people and they each just give me one? So as my mind started working, I started realizing like, if I'm calling for sale by owners, or if I'm calling, or if I'm door knocking, if I'm sitting open houses, if I'm doing all this stuff, what if I spent my time focused on the people I care about, focused on the people who know me, like me, and trust me? Now I bring that up because then you're gonna hear that over and over and over again, because what it boils down to is people do business with people they know, like, and trust. The no part is the lead generation. If they've never met you, you've got to find a way to get an introduction. You have to, whether that's door knocking or a phone call or an introduction from a friend, you've got to get them to know you. Then you got to get them to like you. And this is just about you being you. So where are you looking for people to connect with? If you are, uh, like for me, I was a, a big sports guy. So I would play in a social soccer league or football. Do you guys call it soccer or football? Football? Football. That's right. Football. Okay. Got it. So I would play in a, in, a, in a football league and all of a sudden I realized like the 20 people that I was playing with every single week became close friends and I started selling each one of them houses because I was always in close proximity with them. I was always talking to them. We were always hanging out. So then that was on a Tuesday nights so and I said, you know what? I'm going to play softball on our baseball on Wednesdays. And I started playing on a new team. Then I started playing kickball on Thursdays. And every day of my, of my week, I had a different social sports league that I was playing in because I enjoyed doing it. And at the same time, it put me in front of people that could know, like, and trust me over time as I got to know them. So when I ask you to lead generate, I'm not telling you to go do anything that you don't actually enjoy. In fact, if you're a big golfer, then go play with a random uh, threesome. So you're the fourth every week. And each time you're going to meet three new people and you're going to see if you connect with them and you're going to see if they need help in real estate or they know somebody to help them in real estate. Maybe you're, um, you know, aspiring chef and you really like cooking, go take a cooking class. You know, they have these eight and 10 week long cooking class where you go every week with the same people and you all learn how to cook something. If you enjoy that, go there and spend time with the people doing something that you enjoy. 
I had somebody that uh, on my team that loves board games and he went online and he found a group that meets once a week and they play board games and each week it's a different board game. So he went there and he started playing and he's having fun, enjoying himself. The people are getting to know the real him and then he started getting business from it. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of roller derby. I don't know, but there, there was a girl on my team and she would go to roller derby and she became the roller derby realtor. And that was just her thing. So what I'm telling you is first, we have to understand who we're going after and don't go chase something that you don't enjoy. If you hate golf, don't go out and golf every week just to get customers. Go find something you do enjoy and spend time with people that are doing something they enjoy as well. You're going to bond quicker. You're going to develop a stronger trust. So let's talk about trust because trust is important. They've done studies that when, when you ask the general population, how many people are trustworthy? So just think right now, your entire city or your entire country, whatever you want to use, how many of those people are trustworthy? You would hand them your wallet and say, give me an hour, I'll be right back. And then you would leave and come back with an hour. You'd give them your car keys and you would trust them that they wouldn't steal your car, they wouldn't steal your wallet. What percentage of the people that, you, that, that are in your country would you trust? Now the average answer in most countries is 30%. 30% I would go up and hand a stranger my car keys, there's 70% of them, I would look at them and go, no, I'm not giving them my car keys. No, nope, I don't trust them. So 30% are trustworthy in our minds. So now change it. And if I said, okay, what percentage of the people that you know are trustworthy? How many people, if it was your sister, if it was your cousin, if it was your friend that you went to high school with, if it was the guy that you see in the coffee shop every day, what would you feel then? The average answer, 70% of the people are trustworthy that I know. So what we're learning is we have an ultimate bias. If I don't know you, I automatically don't trust you. In fact, 70% of the time, I do not trust you. Only 30% of the time I do. If I do know you, I, it's the opposite. I automatically trust you. I already feel like, okay, I can trust this person because I know them and I'm a good judge of character. So all of a sudden we realize that when we're doing business, just the fact that they know us will make a massive difference in how quickly we can get them to trust us. So this is where I want you to start thinking about, so we talked about different sports or different uh, hobbies that we could do to connect with people and get to know them. And as they get to know us, they start to trust us. But let's start, start talking about other people that we know that know us. It could be people you went to school with. It could be people that from your last job. It could be neighbors in your neighborhood. It could be, you know, anything at all where you spent time with people, they got to know you, and there's a level of trust there. So when we talk about finding business, we need people to know us, like us, and trust us. Well, those three things in itself, first, getting someone to know us, how do we do that? How do we connect? We've got to find something to connect with. And it could be we went to school together. It could be we worked at this company together. It could be we did this internship together. That's, that's how they know us. Then they like us. If we spent time with them and we like them and they like us, now we're developing that rapport. And then the trust comes from one of two things. Either they're getting to know us over time and they start to trust us or they've done a transaction with us. So every one of your past clients, everybody who's ever worked with you before chose to do business with you and most likely is happy with the results. So they trust you in a business sense. So sometimes the, the, the person you, for, you knew from school or you knew from your last job, you trust each other, but not quite in a real estate business way, but that's easy to develop once we already have trust. When it comes to real estate trust, it's your past clients. It's anybody you've worked with. So here's where it comes into new agents and agents that have been doing this for a long time. When somebody comes to me and says, hey, Nick, I've been in this business for 10 years, five years, 15 years, whatever it is. And I say, great. The very first group that you need to stay in contact with are your past clients. It's people who know you, like you, and trust you in real estate. 
that's your number one source of business. So anybody you've ever uh, uh, sold or bought a home with, you should have them in a database and you should have an availability to see every single one of those people. You have their name, their email address, their phone number, their address, all of that in there. As you get better at this, you start adding birthdays, you start adding home anniversaries, you start adding favorite sports teams, you start adding hobbies, kids' names, kids' ages. We can get pretty, ex pretty expansive with that, but I wanna keep this pretty basic and say like the first thing, that's what we need. We need that group of people. So if you think right now, let's say you had 100 past clients in your lifetime. If I would have told you to call them a year ago and every three months you called and had a conversation with them. Hey, Jonathan, it's Nick. I just wanted to check in, see how you're doing with this pandemic and everything that's going crazy. I was just thinking about you and your family. And then he says, oh man, we're doing great or it's, it's really rough. Whatever it is, that's okay. And then another three months go by and I check on them again. And this time I might say, you know, hey, Jonathan, remember that restaurant you really liked uh, over? So my wife and I finally went, it was great. And I just thought of you and the family. I hope you're doing well. If you notice, I'm just being friendly. I'm not asking him for referrals. I'm not asking for business. So if you think about all of your past clients, if you would have had that relationship where once a quarter, four times a year, you got on the phone with them and had a friendly conversation about whatever, what are the chances that they would give you more referrals than they did this year? What would it look like to hear, oh yeah, my, my, uh, my sister just had their third baby and you know, they're busting at the seams in their house. Hmm, I know I can help with that. So, or uh, you know, my, my uh, great uncle just passed and you know, now the kids have you know, property to sell and they've got all kinds of stuff going on. It's, it's, a, it's a big mess. I can help with that. Or I just got a new job. I got promoted. I want to buy a bigger house. Great. I can help with that. What we're looking for is the reason I said we're not calling and asking for referrals. We're calling and looking for life events. So there's five major life events that will cause someone to buy or sell real estate. Okay. So the first one is a growth in family size. It could be getting married, it could be having a baby, it could be uh, you know, anything that involves the family growing, having their second child, third child, fourth child, whatever. The opposite of that is when the family is, is downsizing. So all the kids have moved out, now it's just mom and dad. Uh, you know, on a negative sense, it could also be a divorce. So we have marriage on one side and divorce on the second. So there's all these different things that could talk about them wanting to downsize their house because they don't have the same needs they had five years ago. So the next one is uh, your job, your job increase. You got a promotion, you're moving to a different area, you, uh, you know, whatever that is, you've gotten to a point where you can afford something bigger, that job change in a positive direction makes you wanna move. On the opposite side of that, what if you got downsized? What if you got furloughed? What if you got laid off? What if you got fired? It might be a need to sell that house because you just can't afford it anymore. And we're there for that as well. So whether going up, going down, we're always there. And the last one is the toughest one, which is death. When someone dies, you know, I just had a client call me yesterday. She lives in Oklahoma, which is about 35 hours by car away. So we're talking across the country. And she said, my great uncle passed. He has a house in Columbia, which is five minutes from my office. And I don't need the house. I don't want to live in the house. I don't want to move to Maryland. I, I, I need to sell the house. And I said, you know, I'm really sorry about your, your uncle. And I'm happy to help you with that. So when we think of death, I don't want you to think about like running after ambulance and, and trying to like find people that are de dead, but understand that when someone dies, there is a lot of stuff that has to get done in terms of their funeral, their estates, their, their, um, any residences they own. That's all part of, it's going to fall on the shoulders of somebody. And if you can help them through that, 
you're really going to help them through a rough time in their life. And you're going to, again, build more and more trust. So we want to, we want to make sure we're reaching out to our clients and we want to stay in a conversational method to look for life events that are going on. How's work? How's the kids? Oh, my wife's pregnant again. Oh my gosh. Is that your third one? Gosh, wait, don't you have a three bedroom? What, what's your plan? Oh man, Nick, I'm really glad you called. We get, we've got to get a bigger house. We've got to, or we need to move out of the city. Or we move, we need to move closer to my work. I want a shorter commute, whatever it is. So that's what we're looking for in these conversations. So if you remember what I said in the beginning, lead generation, we control three things. Number one is the who. Who are we following up with? Who are we calling? Who are we creating genuine, real relationships with? Number two is the frequency. And number three is the intensity. Now, when I said call all of your clients once a quarter, let's think about that intensity. What if I said call them every week? If I called Jonathan and I said, hey, Jonathan, how are you? How's the family? How's everything going? And he said, oh, it's going well, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then I hung up the phone and then I called him next week. And I said, hey, Jonathan, it's Nick. Um, how's the kids? How's the family? How's everything going on? And he's going to go, uh, it's good. And then I'm going to call him week three. And he's going to be like, what? Why is this guy calling me? And then he's going to pick up and I'm going to go, uh, how are the kids? How's the family? How's the house? And he's going to go, good. And then I'm going to call him the fourth week and he's not going to answer. He's like, I'm not answering that phone call. Uh, that weirdo keeps calling me. So the intensity there is too much. So when we talk about intensity, it also uh, inevit inevitably talks about the frequency. So when we're talking about phone calls, why did I choose phone calls as the example that I went over? Here's the very simple, here's the very simple method or, or understanding of that. When we communicate, this is the great thing about uh, Zoom right now, is you get to see me, you, need to, you get to hear me, you get to watch my body language, you get to see my tonality, you get to see my hand moments, everything that I'm doing, I'm communicating on a much higher level than let's say if I was sending you this in a text message or an email. So we know the, the highest form of contact is face to face. Now obviously you guys are in Malaysia and I'm here in the United States, so face-to-face -face wasn't an option. So what's the next best thing? It's face-to-face -face over a computer screen. And you'll connect with someone more and you'll develop more of a relationship with that. Let's say we couldn't get a Zoom in. What's the next level down from that? It's a, it, it's a phone call. So face-to-face -face is great, but the availability for us to, to, to meet with every past client every single month or every single quarter, it's just too much, too daunting. We'd never be able to do it face to face. So when we do it with Zoom or when we do it with, uh, with phone calls, that's the next best way to connect with people. And now after that, there's a couple different methods to connect. So all the way down at the bottom, I would say, is probably email. How much email do you guys get that you just delete, 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 delete? that you don't read, you don't look at it, you don't think about any of that stuff. So just know that that's the lowest form. If, if that's your only communication method with all your past clients and all the people that know you, like you, and trust you, you're going to struggle because you're never gonna really connect. You've gotta pick up the phone, you've gotta call them once a quarter, okay? Now, the next method that I think is one of the best way to connect with people is through social media. So social media is amazing. People post all types of things of their life. If they're a social media person, they're putting things on the vacation they went on that you can also see people getting married, having kids, you know, all of that stuff happens on social media as well. You can see the, you know, the, uh, the, you know, job promotions, everything's put out there. You can see what they ate last night at dinner, which is weird, but that's one of the things. So first we have to understand social media and why it's so addicting. Why is it so powerful of, a, of a, a media that we all, I mean, how many people have social media on their cell phone? I would say probably everybody in this room is going to raise their hand and say, yeah, I do. So the reason that we all have it is because when we go onto social media and when we post something and other people like it, other people comment on it, other people laugh at it, 
we actually get a release of dopamine in our brains. And dopamine is the same thing that's released when you do cocaine. So we're talking a very powerful substance that's released because somebody liked or commented on your post. Is that insane? And then we get that dopamine hit and then we want more of it. We want more of it. So we post more and we put more out there and we, and sometimes we post something and nobody comments and we're like, Oh man, no dopamine. And then we pick something else and we put it on there and everybody comments and it's dopamine, 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 dopamine. And it's that type of relationship we have with social media, which creates uh, that love and that desire and that need for us to go into our social media so often. So knowing that that's in my opinion the next level of communication so if i uh so now i'm calling once a quarter so three months in a quarter once a quarter i'm calling so month two i'm not going to call again because jonathan doesn't want to hear from me but i'm going to go on his social media page and i'm going to connect with him and jonathan just went to a concert last night let's pretend COVID doesn't exist for the moment jonathan went to a concert last night and I'm like, wow, that, what, that must have been a great concert. You know, how are your seats? Or he has a picture of a puppy. And I say, oh my God, Jonathan, that's the cutest dog. What kind is it? So I'm making a comment and I'm asking a question. So what is Jonathan or anyone going to do when all this happens? One, he's going to like my comment. And then two, he's going to write me a response to the question oh, that is a German short-haired pointer. You know, I've been wanting that dog my whole life. I'm so happy my family has it. And then I write back and then I like his comment. And then I write back, well, that's awesome. I hope you and the family are doing well. If you ever need anything, I'm always here. And that's it. So what I just did is I connected with him for two to four minutes. It's not a long amount of time. During our connection, there was a dopamine hit in his brain, which makes him like me even more. And I never asked for his business. I never pushed for anything. I never did any of that stuff. I just stayed in, in uh, what I like to call emotional proximity. So let me explain what emotional proximity is. If I was flying to Malaysia and I was coming to your city, your town where you live right now, and I said, hey, I'm going to be there next week. I want to go to a really nice restaurant. Like, where should we go to eat? I guarantee that every one of you has a restaurant that just popped into your mind. In fact, you probably have a restaurant in mind. You probably know what you'd order there or what you'd suggest for me. You probably either know the cook or the waiter or the, uh, or the owner or somebody that you see all the time when you go there. You probably know I'd rather sit in that back, back area because it's quieter instead of this front area. You've got an emotional proximity to that restaurant and you know exactly what it is you'd order, where the quality of food you would get, you, the prices, you have it all already mapped out in your head because you're in emotional proximity with that. Now the same thing happens and let's say you're coming to the United States, you're coming to my city and, and I say, hey, Guys, I'll take you anywhere you want to go. Where do you want to go to dinner? You're going to then go, uh, I got to Google it. I've got to go on Yelp. I've got to check Facebook reviews. I've, I, I've got to do some research to try to figure this all out because you're not in emotional proximity with the restaurants that are close to me. You're only in emotional proximity with the ones close to you. So our goal as real estate agents is to stay in emotional proximity so that when I talked to Jonathan about his new puppy and then tomorrow he's at work and a colleague says, Hey, I just, uh, I just got the job. You know, I'm, I'm new to the company thinking about moving here. You know, can you help me uh, with any, uh, any advice on where I should move or anything like that? Then Jonathan goes, Oh, actually my realtor is amazing. Let me connect you with him. Let me help. Let me, uh, let me let him help you. And now this, this new colleague is like, Oh, that'd be great. I really appreciate it. And then Jonathan calls you and says, hey, Nick, I know I just talked to you the other day. I got this new guy at work and he's looking for a new place to live. And I'm like, oh, great, Jonathan, I'd love to help them. I got to tell you, I really appreciate you thinking of me and, and just kind of passing this along. I'd love to help. And then I connect and I start going. So the only way that happens 
is if when somebody mentions real estate, Jonathan thinks of me. And the only way he thinks of me is if we're in emotional proximity. So month one in the quarter is a phone call to create that emotional proximity. Month two is a social media touch of some kind. And then month three, there's a couple of different things we can do. One that I really like is a handwritten card. So if I send him a handwritten card, most people are gonna look down in their mail and they're gonna see a self-addressed or a hand-addressed envelope and they're gonna go, oh, I wonder what this is. And they're actually gonna open it and they're actually gonna read it. How long are they gonna read it for? Eh, two to five seconds. That's all I need. I just need to be, I just need his mind to be reminded that I exist. And in the card, I could say anything. I could say, you know, um, hey, uh, just thinking of you and your family. Hope you guys are doing well. You know, call me if you need anything, whatever. It could be as basic as that. Now, let's say I didn't do a handwritten note. Let's say I did this month. This month, I decided to do a text message. So a text message might say, um, hey, Jonathan, I was just in your neighborhood, drove by your house. I've got some new buyers. We were looking at some properties close by, and I thought about you and the family. I just hope everything's going well. Now, I didn't ask him for anything. He doesn't even have to respond. But let's unpack what I just said in that little text message. One, I'm still in real estate. Two, I'm a local expert to your area. I'm showing, I'm showing buyers around there right now, which means three, if you have anybody that wants to buy, I'm a great resource for that. And then selling, if you know anybody in the area looking to sell, you already know I have buyers, so call me on that. And number five, which is just as important as I care. Hey, I was thinking about you and the family. I hope you're doing well. So if you notice, I made a genuine connection as well as very, uh, very subtly mentioned that, yes, I'm still in real estate. And yes, I'd still like to help anyone they know. So what we're looking at is the, the who of what we're following up with. Then we have the frequency. Then we have the intensity. So the frequency ends up being every single month. But the intensity of that conversation or that connection is, goes like this, okay? Now we call this method, so this is a method that I developed when I was, uh, you know, kind of first getting through my, my sticking point of 40 deals a year to push myself up to more. We call this the 555 method. Now the 555 method means this, on January 1st, well, okay, well first, the first thing you have to do in order to do the, the, uh, the 555 method, you have to have the group of people that you're going to connect with. You've got to identify them first. So when you think about that, what did we say the highest connection is? It's anybody that knows us, likes us, and trusts us in a business sense. When I say business sense, I mean they've sold or bought real estate with me, so they, uh, they, they recognize my level of, of confidence there. That's the highest level. That's for agents that have had tons of past clients that have been in real estate for a while, all that stuff. So now the next level is people that know us, like us, and trust us, maybe not in real estate, but they trust us. So these are the people that you went to high school with, or that you uh, grew up with, or you were at your last job with, or you spent a lot of time with, or you know, friends of friends, whatever, all those people that already know you, already like you, already trust you, just haven't trusted you in a real estate capacity, that's your next level. Now that level can be for anybody. If you started your real estate career yesterday and you've never sold a home, okay, no problem, that's the group you're starting with. And then when you go down from there, it starts to get harder and harder to create real connections if they don't really know you or they don't really trust you or they don't really like you. So we, that's, where we're, where, that's where we're going. Now, here's the good news. The, the list does not have to be huge. In fact, what I tell people is I'd rather see a quality list than a quantity list. So remember in the very beginning when I said, man, if I wanna sell 50 homes, what if I just knew 25 people that could give me two referrals a year? And that's the only 25 people I followed up with and stayed in contact with in order to get those two referrals every year. That list, if I could find 25 people to always give me two deals a, a year, that list is supreme quality. Now in reality, I probably, if I want 50 referrals, 
I probably need a hundred total people because I would say in any given year, you know, one and two might have a referral for me. So Jonathan might give me a referral this week and William might give me a referral next month, uh, next year. And then it kind of ebbs and flows. So we're not looking for massive quantity. We're looking for massive quality. And the number in my head that I think hits all those numbers is 325. So 325 people is what you're looking to develop in your list. Now, is it easy to do? Yes, because you know them, you like them, you trust them already. Is it easy not to do? Yeah, because it's like, oh yeah, yeah I saw, I see that guy all the time or you know, that, that person from work, my last job, I actually haven't talked to them in a year or two, but we're always like, we jump right back in whenever we see each other. It's very easy not to put those people on a list and stay truly in emotional proximity with them. But it's also very easy to do it. So that's what I wanna push you guys to do, is do the easy, get this rolling. So we want 325 people in total. And here's why. If I would call five people every day, Monday through Friday for one full quarter, guess what that number is? It's 325 people. Now, why five? Why not 10? Why not 20? Why not 50? Because again, simple is what works. If I call five a day and then tomorrow I get sick and I can't make any phone calls, can I make up 10 on the next day and get back right back on track? Yeah, it's not hard. In fact, if I have a really busy day today, do I have time to do five phone calls? Well, considering a phone call with, with someone that you're, you're developing a genuine connection with and generally checking in on, it's about a five minute phone call each time. So I need 25 minutes in my day. Does anybody not have 25 minutes that if you spend that every day, Monday through Friday, your business explodes and it explodes in a way of referral business. So people that are automatically coming to the transaction, knowing you, liking you and trust you, because their friend or their neighbor or their you know, cousin, whoever, suggested you. It's a much easier way to do business that way, but you've gotta make those five phone calls every day. So we talked about how the frequency, and the, uh, the frequency needs to be once a month, the intensity needs to vary. So if I call five people on January 1st, on February 1st, I need to call five new people but then I also need to take the five from January and I need to connect with them. And that's where I'm going to do the social media touch. So January 1st, my only job, call five people, five minutes a piece. It's going to take me 25 minutes each. That's my total lead gen for the day in terms of people that know me, like me and trust me. Month two, I've got five new calls to make. And those five new calls will take about five minutes each. That's 25 minutes. And then I've got to connect so on social media probably two minutes each time to make a comment on somebody's social media page. It's very quick. So with five people, that's 10 minutes. My total lead gen is now 35 minutes. And I do that through the entire month of February. March 1st, the five people I called on January 1st, I'm now sending them a text or handwritten note. The five people I called on February 1st, I'm now at the, at the stage where I'm touching them on social media. And then March 1st, I have a new five. So this is the first time the five, five, five comes into play. Five phone calls, five social media touches, and five text messages or handwritten notes. Now here's the, here's the, the beauty of this system. Once you get through the first 90 days, you no longer have to think about anything. Because if I said to you, who do you, who do you reach out to on April 1st, you would, you would say, well, that's easy. Uh, April, so on March 1st, I was calling somebody. So April 1st, that, those are the five people I social media touch. And the month before that, I was social media touching. So now I need to send them a text or handwritten note. And the month before that, I was calling. So now I need to call again. So does that make sense where once you choose January 1st, this is my 555, every three months, it'll be exactly the same. You never have to think about it again. So that's the key to this. And people always say, well, Nick, where do I start? Who cares? Just get your list at 325 and start calling until five people answered. And the second that five people answered, that's now their day. 
They're, they're set on January 1st, which means they're set on February 1st, March 1st, April 1st. Every other month is already done with them. And then the next day you call and you might call 12 people before you get five to answer the 12 or the seven people that didn't answer. You're not taking them off the list, but the five that did answer, boom, they're stamped into January 2nd, which means they're automatically on February 2nd, automatically on March 2nd. And it just keeps going, 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 going. So the first 90 days is the easiest and the hardest. Because remember, we start out with 30 days of the first month is just phone calls. So it's 25 minutes to get started. The second month is your social media touches plus your first, your five phone calls, five new phone calls. And then that's about 35 minutes of, file, of lead gen. And then your third month is when you finally get up to the 45 minutes a day of lead gen by calling social media touch and handwritten note or text. So now if you notice what I did, if I told you, Hey guys, we're all going to run a marathon. I wouldn't say show up to race day and let's give this a shot. I would say, so we're going to run a marathon in a year. So this week, everybody run a quarter of a mile. And then next week, everybody run half a mile and we're going to slowly work up to it. So that's exactly, exactly the goal we have here is to work towards that. All right. So now I put a lot of information out there to kind of explain the 555 method. But the best part about this is the communication and it's going to be the questions you guys are going to ask now. So I want to push you guys to come out and ask me questions about anything that we've talked about, because any question that you have, there's also somebody else that has the exact same thing. So if you have a question, put it in the chat box or, or unmute yourself and just talk either or, but we'll start with, uh, with Charles questions. Uh, someone who had done real estate transaction with you before. Yeah. So anybody that is a past client, that's your number one person that you're putting your list of 325. Uh, somebody asked if you get over 325, what do you do? Remember, we're talking about quantity or quality, not quantity. So has anyone done a transaction with somebody that they didn't really like by the end of the transaction? They were pretty annoyed with them or they didn't really like them or just whatever, what just was off. I have, and you know what I do with that person? I don't put in my five, five, five because I need to call them and connect with them and generally, genuinely like them. And if I don't, I'm not putting them in my five, five, five. Or what if I have somebody in my, in my current five, five, five that I call and text and social media touch and do all this stuff over and over again. And they never really respond with anything. I never really break into that connection. I might take them out and put somebody new in because my goal is that all 325 people give me referrals every year. That's best case scenario. Now I've got 325 pieces of business every year without having to do any marketing. I haven't spent any money. I haven't done anything outside of connecting genuinely. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other question for you, Nick? Um, I've got two questions. The first question is, um, you, you, you kind of shared in the earlier part of this call that it is so easy to do this and it's also so easy not to do this. What are some of the suggestions that you have for the audience here today? How can we avoid the so easy not to do this thinking and mentality? Because that's, really that's really one of the key issues I think most people have. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if, you, if you've ever read the book, um, Atomic Habits, uh, it's a great book about habits and about how they develop. And one of, the, one of the greatest stories that I really liked was when I was talking about flossing your teeth. So in order to floss your teeth, it's very simple. You get up from your bed. When you go into the bathroom, you open your drawer, you pull out the little square thing of floss, you pull out the right amount, you wrap it on your fingers, and then you go ahead and start flossing. That seems pretty simple, right? Simple to do. But the average person doesn't do it, believe it or not. The average person doesn't floss every day because the little micro decisions to, okay, let me open that drawer. Let me find that thing. Let me pull out the right amount. Let me wrap it around my finger. These are all micro decisions. There's nothing complicated against any of them. But how much easier is it to walk up to your bathroom and just grab your toothbrush and start brushing your teeth? 
In fact, it's so easy, you would never leave the house without brushing your teeth. You, it would feel weird, it would feel awkward. So you walk up and you grab it and go, boom, boom, boom. You don't even think about it. There's nothing to look for, there's nothing to do. You just grab it and go. So they, the, uh, in the book, they talked about, well, just change the method in, in which you floss. So I went out and bought those little, um, little disposable picks that have like a little piece of string on yep. it. It has like, a, like almost like a long toothpick. And I set one right on top of my uh, electric toothbrush. So now every morning when I walk into the bathroom, the first thing I see is this little toothpick thing right on top of my toothbrush. I pick it up, I do my flossing, I threw it away, and then I brush my teeth. I'm not thinking about where to get the floss. I'm not deciding whether I'm going to floss or not. I just get up. It's already there. It's already done, and I do it. So... When I say it's easy to do and it's easy not to do, nothing I've said here is complicated. It's opening a drawer, finding a little square and pulling out the floss. Nothing is tough about that. But over time, we'll just not wanna make those decisions so we won't do it. But the beauty of this is after the first three months, you are now on autopilot. You never have to wake up and think, okay, five, 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 who do I need to call? Who should I social media touch? Who haven't I texted in a while? You don't, all that's gone. It is you wake up and you say, okay, here's the five people I need to call. Here's the five people I need social media to touch. Here's the five people I need to text. I'm done. I'm gone. I'm moving on with my day. That's how simple you need to make lead gen. Because if it's any complicate, if there's any complications, if there's any micro thoughts that you have to go through, you're going to end up saying, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I mean, I'll, I'll do it again. I'm really busy right now. This is, a, this is an example of no one could be too busy to spend 45 minutes connecting with people because that's what grows your entire business. Yeah. What system do you use to keep track of your 555 spreadsheets? What are some of the things that you would advise us to kind of keep our 555 in track? Yeah. So if anybody has a CRM that they're using, that's perfect. That's exactly what you want to use. So I'm not going to tell you, you have to use command or you have to use sync, or you have to use chime, or you have to, there's all these different ones and we all have one that we like. If you don't have one, then do a little research and find one and get it going. But everybody else, don't change what you're already doing. If you have a system that you understand, you like, and you, and you use, then that's the system you use. And here's a, here's a simple thing you do. So if I put a reminder in today for Jonathan, and I say, call Jonathan today, and then I would put a reminder in 30 days, in 60 days, in 90 days, all the way down through a year. And then I just repeat that cycle. So like on mine, I just hit the repeat button year after year. And then every 30 days, I wake up in the morning, turn on my computer, and it shows me, here's the five people you need to call. It's all right there. I don't think about it. I don't have to look anybody's information up. It's boom. There it is. All right, Charles Lee, I need to call him. Like whatever those are, they're right there in front of you. And exactly. the only way to do it is with technology. You can't do this on your own. You can't remember who did I call last week? Who did I social media? No, no, no. It's, it's got to be simple and that you don't have to think about. Great yeah. question. And, and in command, that's smart plans, right? That's yes, tap. yes, yes, yes. Right, awesome. So okay. in command, there's three, there, there, it's called a quarterly smart plan. That's that, right they actually called me and when, when they were putting command together, they said, what do you need to do your five, five, five method? And I said, I need a quarterly, uh, I need a quarterly um, smart plan. And here's how it works. I have, let's say I'm for Jonathan. I have a quarterly smart plan for a phone call that happens once every three months. I have a quarterly smart plan for a social media touch that happens once every three months. And I have a quarterly uh, plan set up. So I have three, quarterly plans for him that covers all the months of the entire year. And each yep. one of them is slightly different phone call, social media, touch text or handwritten note. Yeah. Awesome. That's Good a pretty question. long question here on the chat box. Uh, Nick, could you see it on the chat box? By uh, yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So after this, you never have to do other lead gen methods and achieve more than the previous year fully or on referral. What if the property so that they refer to you is not in your wheelhouse, you still do it? Okay, great question. So 
one, that has helped my business grow every single year since I started doing it. So when I say we're going to sell over 400 homes this year, it's because that method makes it that much easier to, to sell. Now, if the property's not in your wheelhouse, what I'm telling you and teaching you is to be genuine, to be genuinely coming from contribution. So I had a guy call me um, two days ago and he said, hey, Nick, I want to start an accounting practice and I need a storefront anywhere from two to 5,000 square feet. Now, can I do that? Yeah, I probably could figure it out. Do I know commercial real estate as well as the guy who does that every day for a living? No. So I said, you know, hey, Chuck, I'd love to help you with that. Let me connect you with so-and-so. He specializes in that. I want to make sure you're taken care of to the highest level. And I'll be checking back in with you and making sure the process is going smooth. Then I call Chuck. I get a 25% referral for giving him that business. And then I stay on top of my client to check in and say, hey, how are things working? And he says, oh, man, it was great. We found a spot. I really appreciate you giving me his name. You're the best. I've now heightened my relationship with him. We're now on a higher level of trust because he knows that I'm going to do the right thing for him. Now, do it, can I get rid of all the lead gen methods? It depends. If your goal is to sell 30 homes a year, this is all you need. If you want to sell 300 or 3,000 or 10,000, then you're going to need more. So right now of our 400, about 82% are coming from this method. So 82% of our transactions coming from this method. The rest, it's really simple. Like everywhere I go, everything I post on social media, everything I do is real estate related. So I just get random people that call me now or random people that say, oh, hey, you know, I, I saw you posted, blah, blah, blah. Would you help me with such and such? So yeah, I still get business like that. We still do open houses. None of, what, none of the other stuff I'm telling you not to do but I'm telling you, this should be your foundational piece of your business. This should be the foundation of how you build your business. Okay. I got a follow-up question on that, Nick. Okay. What if I'm doing my 555 right now and I'm not getting any referrals? What happened? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. One, how much time have you given it? You're not going to call somebody the first time and they're going to go, wow, you called me. Oh, I'm going to give you all my referrals. You're building trust. This is, this is a long play. This is not a, you're going to get business tomorrow because you made five phone calls. In fact, it might be several months before any of this starts to pay off. If you've ever seen a, uh, how a locomotive starts, how a train starts, and you have those big wheels and those big pistons, and it's in order to keep a train where it sits on the track, you need about a two by four piece of wood and you put it right under the wheel and the train will not be able to go over that, that wood. It will not be able to get the energy to push through that because it takes so much energy to get those wheels moving. Once the train is moving, it can roll through a six foot steel wall and keep going. So we're talking a two by four to a six foot steel wall. The only difference is momentum. So with this process, you're, you're up against the, the, the wood block at first. It is slow going, slow grinding. And then all of a sudden you start picking up speed. And then all of a sudden you are rolling. You're like, wow, this is really working. That's exactly how this process is. That's exactly how most things in life are. You've got to build the momentum. And then the second you stop making your 555 calls, all your momentum drops and you go right back down to zero and you got to start trying to turn that wheel all over again. So the key is the 555 method is very easy to do 45 minutes and it just keeps the wheels moving. It's not something you have to keep thinking about. Um, after you have your 325 clients, if you have another 50 new clients, what do you do with them? So two things. And do you start uh, leveraging with other agents? Absolutely. Whoever has the relationship with the client is the person who's going to follow up with them. So let's say uh, Jonathan's been my long-term client and he calls me and says, hey, I got this new guy from work I want to introduce you to. He wants to buy a house. And I say, that's amazing. Great. The new guy calls me and I say, okay, tell me what you're looking for. We have a, we build a little rapport. And I say, oh man, 
I've got a great agent on my team. William's going to help you. He's fantastic at what he does. He knows that area really well. I'm really glad you're, you're, you're working with our team and William's going to take care of you. And then I pass him off to William. And now he becomes part of William's 325 because William is going to spend time with him, work with him, develop a relationship with him. And then I'm going to go back to Jonathan because Jonathan gave me business. and I'm going to keep building that, re that relationship with him because I want to keep that going. That's one of many that I want to, want to receive. So one thing I didn't mention is one of the things we do is referral gifts. So the second Jonathan says, hey, I've got somebody I want to introduce you to, I write a handwritten thank you note. This is outside of the 555. I write a handwritten thank you note and said, hey, Jonathan, I got to tell you, I really appreciate you referring your friend. You know, my business is almost 90% word of mouth and it's only through people like you, great people like you, that I'm able to continue to grow my business. So I just want to make sure you know how thankful I am. And I send that in a handwritten note. So he picks up in the mail and he goes, oh, wow, what's this? Opens it and goes, oh, wow, that's really nice. And then the second I meet with the client, so Jonathan's uh, suggestion, I meet with him and we talk about what he's looking for in terms of buying and that works out really well. I now send Jonathan a box of chocolates or cookies or, or, uh, or brownies or something like that. And I say, hey, I just want to reach out again. I just met with so-and-so. The meeting went awesome. I know exactly what he's looking for. We're going out this weekend to see some properties. I just, here's a couple of brownies for you and the family. Enjoy. Thanks again for thanking me. I really appreciate it. Then when we go under contract, so I take that buyer out, I'm looking for homes and I find a home they like. We make an offer and we got it. Now I'm sending to Jonathan something else. I'm sending him a gift card to his favorite restaurant or I'm doing something and I'm saying, hey, great news. We were able to find an incredible house and got it under contract. And Jonathan, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you because none of this would be possible without you. I really appreciate it. So the first gift is a handwritten note, cost $2. The second gift is, that, uh, is the brownies or the popcorn, costs about $25. Then the third gift, which is basically a closing gift for the referral, and that anywhere from $50 to $100, depending on the size of house they're buying. But what happens is, I've now solidified Jonathan giving me a referral because I've reminded him or reminded and thanked him three times. So now the next time somebody says, you know, hey, I'm thinking about buying a house, he thinks, oh, the brownies, the gift certificate, the car, oh yeah, I got a great guy for you. He's awesome. And I build that genuine connection through thanking and giving gifts to the person who referred me, not to the person who's actually buying from me. Awesome. Awesome. It, it's really about creating that relationship, right? It's really about building that relationship because if you don't have that relationship and we're just a salesperson selling a one-off transaction, we are, gonna, we are not going to last long in this business, are we? Mm -mm. Or, or you're going to have to slave through it every single day. And I am a super lazy person and I want to make this business <laughs> as easy as possible and I want to work as little as possible. And I'm hopeful that a lot of you feel the same way, that I don't want to work harder than I need to. I just want to work smart. So this is a very easy method to, re to, to, uh, to work smart. Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier just now about that during the COVID season or in May and June, you had like 40 over contracts written in those two months. Yeah, uh, 45 it, it, in one month, 47 in the second month. And, and that's that's you have a lock a lockdown right now in Baltimore. Is that right? Mm -hmm. What happened? Like, tell us what happened. So, the greatest part about this pandemic was we are all in it together. You guys probably experienced something very similar to what I experienced, and we're on different sides of the world, but everybody is the same. We're all humans. We're all, we all react to this disease in the same way. It's negative for all of us. So it's not polarizing. It's not, it doesn't single anybody out. We're all, it's like the entire humanity against this, this one problem. So whether it's political parties or you know, religious beliefs, there's all these ways to separate us. This is the one thing that we all have in common. 
So my simple method was when we would call, I would just say, hey, Jonathan, listen, with everything that's going on, I'm just checking on you. How are you guys? How is your family? And that conversation went in two different ways. It could go, hey, we're really struggling. My mom came down with it. She's in the hospital. We're not allowed to visit. We're really having a tough time. And then in that case, I might send them something or just send a little pick me up or just thinking of you kind of card or something like that. Or the conversation could go, and I'm sure you guys have had this too. Man, my business is actually booming. We've actually, we're up 30% because now that everybody's online, nobody's going here. My business is on fire. And I, I got to be honest, Nick, I'm, I'm uh, going to make a huge bonus this year and I'm ready to buy a bigger house. And I'm like, absolutely, I get it. And we can definitely help you with that. So if the conversation goes towards real estate, you're perfectly welcome to take it there. But if the conversation goes anywhere else, just stay human, just have a human conversation. And there were so many of my past clients and when I called and I said, hey, I'm just checking on you, how are you, William? They were like, wow, you're the first person to call me and ask me. You're the first person to reach out. I'm not doing anything that's like record breaking, oh my God, how did he think of this? I'm just being real, I'm just being genuine, I'm just calling because I care. And then wherever that conversation goes, it goes. So we started doing that for here, uh, here in, uh, in Maryland. We shut down on March 18th, March 17th, something like that. Right when that happened, we went right into it. We changed all of our scripts. We didn't talk about real estate at all. Every conversation was, how are you? How's the family? How are you dealing with all this? That was our only conversation. And we, and then we, we connected with lots of people that, you know, not everybody does the five, five, five perfectly. Okay. I'll, I'll be honest with you. There's times on my team that I'm like cracking the whip guys, you're you're 10 behind. You need to catch up. There are other people that are every single day. They're perfect and never, never have a, a flub up all that kind of ebbs and flows. So I got really clear that everybody had to be perfect with their reminders and, and be on top of things because right now it means more than anything. And we did that. And then all of a sudden we got in a deeper connection. When you call somebody without an agenda, especially when maybe they're going through trouble, you are a beacon of hope for them. And that bond that they have with you is now so strong, no other agent could come in and try to steal them or say, oh, I'll give you a lower commission or any of that nonsense. You've now created a bond that's not gonna be broken. So COVID for us was this, we changed to, we sh you know, our office is shut down. Nobody's leaving the house. You, you know, I'm in my home office right now. My commute is about three, maybe five steps from the kitchen table. And then I'm in my office and I'm working. So I've got more family time. I've got more uh, time at the house. I'm, I'm eating better because it's all home cooked meals, which is great. Tough for my wife, but great for me. Um, so, you know, overall, this is what we did. We connected with people, we checked on people, we, we saw how we could help. And we found out very quickly that a lot of the people in, uh, in the United States anyway, that had lost their job or been furloughed or been laid off were mostly hourly employees of larger companies. But the hourly employees aren't are necessarily our biggest uh, buyers and sellers of homes. In fact, it's the people that have jobs that, that basically their company said, hey, we can't survive without you. So yeah, yeah, work from home. And everybody, work from home, work from home, work from home. So you have all these people that have more time on their hands, more time to search around real estate, more time to fall out of love with their house. Yeah. How many people look around their house and they're like, this place is too small, or I need a pool, or man, I really wish I had this. I've got people calling out of the woodworks because we're calling and saying, hey, how are you? And they say, Nick, I'm ready to pull my hair out. We have no yard and the kids need to go out and play. We got to move. We need a better house with a better yard. And, I, and there's so many clients that have started to feel that way. And then believe it or not, there are clients who spend a lot of time with their husband and wife and it went the opposite way. I do not want to live with that person anymore. Get me out of this house. That's okay too. Marriage, divorce, kids, death, doesn't matter. We're here to help in whatever situation they're in, whatever life event is going on in their world. 
Cool. Cool. All right. What do we think? Was this, was this helpful and did it transcend our, our countries? Did it, did it make sense there as much as it makes sense here? Well, I, I think being human is universal. That there's no, what, what is different is probably the way we communicate in terms of the conversations and the way we articulate ourselves. That's probably mm -hmm. the certain differences in terms of culture. But I, I think um, it is universal and it's just about being human and caring for someone. Yeah. And when you, when you do that, when you, when you are human, people pick up on that and you bond through that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Cool. Um, is there any, what, what are your kind of last advice or, 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 or tips for some of us here? How can we be more human in our, the way we run our job or mm -hmm. the way we run our business? How can we be a better human being? What, what would you suggest? So start thinking of all of your parents, or I'm sorry, all of your clients, like they're your parents or your grandparents or a best friend, what would you want for them? And that's how you approach every situation. And I, I tell clients all the time, listen, I have to be honest, if it was me after that home inspection, I would want this, this, and this fixed. I know that you only said these two things, but these three things I think are fairly important and maybe we should ask for those as well. And they're like, oh, uh, yeah, okay, we can do that. And it's little things like that, that I'm thinking, okay, what would I want somebody to do if they were helping my mother? What would, what would I want them to do? So that's what I'm gonna do for this person. Um, I'd also, another piece of advice is, I know the number's 325, we talked about that, but you don't need 325 people to get started. In fact, if you just need enough for this week, you need 25. If you just need enough for two weeks, you only need 50. And over the next two weeks, find 25 more or find 50 more. And you just keep going until you hit the tree 25. And then you start plugging and play. Okay, with this one, I don't want them in there anymore. And this new one I'm going to put in. And then this one has been terrible. And then this one I'm going to add in. And you're constantly just uh, switching until you get down to 325 people that you truly enjoy talking to and truly enjoy communicating with. You have a great relationship. Like that's the goal is that every right. single one of your 555 calls, you're like, oh man, I can't wait to talk to Eric. I love that guy. Hey, Eric, how are you? You're excited that it's his turn for the phone call. Like that's how you want every call to look. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, I'm gonna ask you to hold on for a couple of minutes. I would have mixed a few announcements that I'll come back to you for the final last thoughts for all of us here in this call. Um, uh, virtual support, can I have the announcement out please? Thank you. Now, some of the things that we talk about, some of the strategies or some strategies that we have are really based on some of these great books that Gary Keller, our founder, has written. Uh, if you are uh, new to our KW Malaysia virtual trainings, you are able to kind of reach out to us on helloeverything.com and someone will be there to kind of answer certain questions on how you could get hold of those books that I think is probably essential and necessary for all of us to kind of build our business on. Um, the next slide, please. We will have a, another training session um, by Jeff Cohn, which is probably another icon in Keller Williams as well, uh, out of Omaha, Nebraska. He'll be training uh, uh, this session on 16th of July on Thursday. Our goal in KW Malaysia is to bring in much more valuable uh, training, just like how Nick is being valuable in sharing his time, taking the time out of his business to kind of work with us and kind of give us his perspective. So Jeff will be with us as well. On the 16th of July, I would really encourage everyone here to kind of sign up for this course as well so that we could um, work together and learn together and have that learning-based mentality to really thrive through this season of challenge. So um, please do sign up for this um, particular session as well with Jeff Cohn. Um, Nick, my, what are the last thoughts that you have for our audience here today in terms of how are we going to embrace this new challenge in this COVID-19 pandemic? What should we do right now? Some last so, thoughts before we end. So I think the number one thing that you should be doing is developing a routine. And I, I like to call it bookending my day. So every single day I get up at 5 a.m. 
every Monday through Friday, I go, I get up, I come downstairs, I go to the gym from 5.30 or, or work out, whatever. I work out from 5.30 to 6.30. I come back, I have a protein shake. I've got a little bit of time with my son. I'm showered, dressed, and I'm sitting here in front of my computer because I know I have an 8 a.m. every single day, Monday through Friday. By the end of my day, I've got a 4.30 follow-up call with everybody who was on my 8 a.m. call. So at 8 a.m., we're, we're, the entire team is discussing what went on yesterday, what uh, you know, um, objections did we hear that we didn't know how to answer, or what scripts do we need to go over in a little more detail, or what do we need to press on? Like, what is happening right now that we need better training on, and we work on that? And then everybody sets their goal for the day. So you know, Jonathan says, you know, I want to call my 555, and then William says, I want to run an open house, and Eric says it, you know, everybody has something they want to accomplish for the day. We set that off at 12 o'clock. It's a break where we have a, a tr another training. So at 12 o'clock, we start, we, we do a big training with the entire team. And then again, there's this blank space till 4.30. At 4.30, the call is, all right, Jonathan, did you hit your 555? Yes or no? Okay, Eric, did you do your open house? Great. Okay, William, did you get whatever it is that you were looking to accomplish that day? And we do that every single day. And we didn't do that prior to COVID, but now we do. And what happens is you develop a routine. Like I know when I get off the phone at 8.30, I only have until 12 when I need to be teaching again. So anything I wanna get done, anything of importance gets pushed into that small amount of time and everything else gets ignored. If anybody else calls me, ignore, I've got, I only have so much time, I need to get the most important things done. So one of those books, The One Thing that um, Gary and Jay Papazon wrote is incredible in terms of helping you understand that the way to succeed is actually by saying no to more things. By like, and, that, and that goes for education as well. When you do an educational class like this, what I can tell you is there are people that go they write it down and they implement it and those people take off and there are people that go write it down and then go to another and write it down and go to another and write it down and go to another and they never actually implement anything. You can't learn to swim watching YouTube videos. Okay. Eventually you've got to jump in the pool and, this, and, and feel it for, your, for, your, for yourself. That's the same thing here. No matter who's teaching you what, you got to try it and put it into action. Fail at it miserably at first. No big deal. Just try, try, try and get better as you go. Wow. Thank you. That's, that's awesome advice. Now, Nick, thank you so much for taking your time off your business to come and share. I know time is very precious for you. And, and you, you, you have done so much uh, in this probably 40, uh, an hour and 20 minutes to kind of help us see how you run your business in your system. Everyone on this call, I want, want you, if you could, in one sentence or one word, please express your gratitude to Nick for taking his time off your business so that um, um, he will come back again next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And Jonathan, I'll go one step further. If you, if you send me an email, I'll send you my 555 written out, explained you know, line by line so you guys have something you can use as kind of a reference or a study point. Thank you very much, guys. So here you, here you go, guys. Nick is going to send us his 555 written plan so that we all have a sample to work off with. So thank you so much, Nick. Uh, you, have, you have been a blessing for us today, this, this evening or your morning. Um, whenever the lockdown is over and you're traveling to Asia in Malaysia, um, we welcome you and I'll let you know that the food in Malaysia is awesome. So, so you and your family is welcome to visit us anytime and we would want... Um, you to have a good time here in Malaysia with us as well. I love that idea. As soon as COVID is done, we're on our way to Malaysia. There you go. You have a good one, Nick. Um, have a rest, good rest of the day and we wish you all the best for you and your family. Stay safe. Thank you, you guys too. Okay, everyone else, thank you for joining us on this call. Um, have a good night. Um, we'll see you all later. Um, please sign up for the training by uh, Jeff Cohn, okay? So you would be able to learn from the best of the best. Thank you very much, guys. So have a good one.